Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's me, Julia Myers, and I am coming to you live from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. And we are super excited for our program this afternoon. We have Dustin Angel from the Archbold Biological Center, and we are so excited to have him tell us about the work that they do there and uh, the research they have going on. And if anyone has any questions throughout the program today, we will answer all of them at the end, but you can go ahead and put them in the chat box and I'll keep track of them so that we can um, not lose track and you don't have to remember your question all the way at the end of the program. And I do um, want to ask everyone to please keep your audio and your camera off today. We are recording this and would like to put it up on your YouTube channel. And if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat for me as well as we go throughout the program. And without further ado, I'm going to toss it to you, Dustin. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much. How is the uh, PowerPoint looking right now? It looks perfect. Yay. Okay. Well, welcome. And thank you all for joining me. We're going to take uh, a journey through Archbold Biological Station's uh, different research and conservation and education projects. And I am excited to have you along because I know on one hand, you're over on the coast. Actually, it looks like we've got somebody from St. Augustine too. Um, from you're in different parts of Florida, but really Florida is all connected because if you're a bear or a panther, doesn't matter to you, you're moving, moving along through it. And actually wildlife corridors is one of the things we'll talk about today. So this is Archbold Biological Station, what we do and why it matters. First, we're going to start out with what is a field station and then what is Archbold and, and you know, where do we work? and then go into four pillars of research and conservation. This is a way for Archbold to try to put all the different things that we do into four categories to make them um, make a little more sense. And then I'll talk um, briefly at the end about education and outreach. First off, what is a field station? People are generally familiar with state parks and national parks and zoos and preserves and county parks, um, but a field station is something a little bit different. Here's a map uh, showing field stations all around the world. There's over a thousand field stations around the world. And what they are is they're, they're research and learning institutions, but they're embedded in natural laboratories. They have land there. Most of them in the U.S. are run by uh, universities, but Archbold Biological Station is just an independent organization. And we started off as just a field station, but we've really grown uh, in the scope of what we do over the last um, 80 years. 81 years, actually, now. So this is where Archbold is. So you can see on the map there, the little logo, that's the Archbold logo. And I've circled for you the Lake Wales Ridge. When you're looking at a picture of Florida from space, now that you see this, you'll never miss it. When you're looking down, you'll notice there's a strip, like a little spine going right up the middle of the state. That's the Lake Wales Ridge. And it's an ancient sand dune island. You can see the other picture there shows some of the other ones in, in the center of the state. There are more, there, there are sand dunes on the coasts too, um, but the, what makes this one special is it's the oldest, it's the highest, uh, it's the biggest, and that's because it's in the center of the state. So if you imagine going back in time millions of years, there's been times when the ocean was higher than it is today, and the water pushing the sand up to the middle of the state. So that gives us lots of cool stuff to, to look at here, interesting plants and animals. We don't just work on the ridge. So this map here shows um, the ridge is, is outlined going through the center of that, uh, of that map. And you can see Lake Okeechobee on the bottom right. But that other area, that big tan block there, that's 2.6 million acres. That's everywhere from just south of Orlando to Lake Okeechobee. Um, and that is the northern part of the Everglades. We call it the headwaters of the Everglades because the, 
when it's raining in these areas, uh, and this is where the water is going. Um, and Archbold, we're down towards the bottom of that, but you'll notice there's a whole lot of marks on here. We have two main, main parts of our property, Archbold Station, and then about eight miles east of here is Buck Island Ranch, uh, Cattle Ranch, which I'll talk about later. But look at all those little orange or red marks all over. We work all throughout this whole headwaters region. So some of the work takes place on our own property, but we, we work with different kinds of agencies um, and private landowners. I threw in this little um, population graph here on the side because when you're thinking, why does it matter? Why would a field station be important? Uh, to me, the simple answer is this graph right there. When Archbold was founded in 1941, there were 2 million people here in Florida. Today, we are pushing 22 million. We're almost to 22 million. That's a lot. And we already had some environmental problems back before 1941 with, with people. Um, so we can imagine it's gotten a lot tougher. Florida hasn't gotten any bigger. There's still the same amount of room there, but we have a lot more people, a lot to balance between what people need and what the animals and plants need. Recently, we've been doing some strategic um, prioritizing at Archbold. It's, it's hard to explain what we do because we have a staff of about 55 and they work in many different places. We also have visiting researchers who come from around the country and sometimes from, from other countries. So we do lots of things, um, but sometimes we say, oh, we need to put these into categories. So these categories are not perfect, but these are some new categories that we're excited about as we try to figure out what direction we want Archbold to go in the future. So we have four of them, saving the rarest of the rare, Two, sustaining grasslands, ranches, and working lands. Three, connecting landscapes and wildlife corridors. And four, addressing climate change. I'm going to go into each one of these with examples for you. Saving the rarest of the rare. I would say that is what Archbold is known for. If you talk to somebody that knows Archbold, say, oh, what do you like about them? You probably say, oh, I, you know, I love that they've been studying Florida scrub jays since the 1960s. That's so cool. Um, oh, I heard they've got lots of gopher tortoises there. So we are known for doing um, work with endangered species. And Florida scrub jays, I would say, is what we're most well known for. So we, we, yeah, we have been studying scrub jays since the 1960s. We put bands on them when they're young. Um, we monitor their families, we monitor their territories. Every month we do a census and we have generations and generations. I think we're up to generation 15 now uh, of scrub jays and we know we have it all mapped. We have, we have all their family trees mapped, pretty amazing. And this is a, a species that um, overall is not doing well because of habitat loss, but here at Archbold they have a, a safe place. And what we learn about them helps other places also know how to manage the land for them. Um, this picture of Chelsea shows her with a, a scope and what, the, what they do with these is there's a little camera and a tube like you see a hose you see there and you stick it in the gopher tortoise burrows and you can see what's going on in the gopher tortoise burrows. When we took this photo, um, it ended up being kind of funny because the tortoise came out. So you, if you look closely, I don't know how well it'll share on the screen, but you can see there's actually a tortoise sitting right inside the entrance. Florida grasshopper sparrow is another one. This is an incredibly rare species. One of the, um, one of the rarest birds in North America. This is, a, this is a subspecies of the grasshopper sparrow that is only found in Florida. And so we've been working on, on this species for, well, I'm not sure exactly how long, um, a dec more than a decade. We have a lot of uh, plants that, a lot of rare plants, and some of which are found nowhere else except for on the Lake Wales Ridge because it's that old island. It's similar to going to uh, the Hawaiian Islands or, Galap or the Galapagos 
uh, islands. So it's a, it's a place where species have been isolated. And also it's a tough place to live because that sand is um, pretty, uh, pretty much has no nutrients in it. And then you have fire because there's lightning and then there's drought and heat and then hurricanes. So, so the, uh, the things that do live here have had to learn to adapt. So here's uh, just uh, some examples. Um, Aaron Davis is the head of our plant ecology program. People who know Archbold from years back will know that Eric Mengus was our director. He, he retired recently. So Aaron is our new director of plant ecology. Um, some examples of research with, with the uh, Oryngium annual surveys since the 1980s with this little tiny St. John's wort, Hypericum camicula. Um, we've been doing annual surveys since the, the mid 90s. And you can see we're tracking, when I say annual surveys, we're tracking almost 2,000 individuals of those on the Lake Wales Ridge. So that gives you an idea of what some of the, the work we do is. Um, this picture of, of Aaron is him in a type of scrub called rosemary scrub. And it's a place with a lot of sandy gaps. And the gaps are there because the rosemary puts down its chemical warfare, puts down chemicals to inhibit the growth of other plants. Um, but some specialists like these two can pop up in there. Here's Stacy Smith uh, on one of her last days of field work um, before uh, having her little boy doing some Sisyphus work. This tangle of thorn bushes is actually one of the rarest plants in North America. It's so rare that when they, when the scientists were looking at it in the 1980s from, from an old specimen, they said, oh, no one's seen this in a while. I think it's extinct. And then they started finding some populations here and there um, in, in this part of Florida. And Archbold is one of a few partners that are helping bring this back from the brink of extinction. Uh, so just yeah, a couple of things, you know, narrowly endemic, only found, um, I think it's just the Lake Wales Ridge, but only found in the, at least the central ridges. And it is uh, in pastures, which is one of these interesting things where cattle ranching becomes so important because cattle ranching, um, those ranch lands are mostly undeveloped. This spot right here is on a ranch and the landowners allow Archbold to go in and do this work. They even fence it, fence it off to protect these, uh, this rare species. Oh yeah, the flowers are really small. <laughs> so I, I wanted to show you how small the flowers are. Now, um, it's not just protecting rare species. The ecosystem itself, the Florida scrub is a rare ecosystem. So you can see here that is this was from the from 1995, and I haven't seen anything quite any other projects quite like this since then. But um, you can see the Florida scrub is listed as number 15. You notice those other Florida, the other ones in red are also found in Florida: longleaf pine and savanna, way up there at number three. So when you're thinking about habitats um, and preserving the rarest of the rare habitats. It's also understanding the complex web of life and habitats. And I'm, I'm not going to like spend 20 minutes trying to show what these graphs are, but what you're seeing there represents many, many years and hours of scientific observations, na natural observations. Mark Darup, some people might know him as our bug guy. Um, he has spent uh, 40 years at Archbold um, collecting insects and observing them, visiting different flowers. Um, he and other researchers have done this, and this is basically putting all of that together, all, all the flower visitor observations together. Um, and here's a, um, two other projects just looking at a specific flower and then trying to figure out, okay, which species visit that flower. So on the left is a blueberry, on the right is the Palafoxia. It's a pretty little flower. That's the one that Annika is looking at. And what insects visit them? And then which of those overlap? They're trying to understand not just what's out there. It's not just a list of what's rare or what's there. 
it's understanding how it all works together uh, as an ecosystem. The next pillar here is sustaining grasslands, ranches, and working lands. And if you are unfamiliar with this idea, um, I have a little simple thing here. Florida ranches equals conservation. So the reason that we say that at Archbold is because ranch land is mostly big open landscapes without many roads, uh, without many buildings, and the, the birds, like there's, this is a care care on the top right, birds, panthers, bears, they are using these lands. The ranches are, are what's standing in the way, or what's holding back the tide of development in Florida. Remember that, that um, little graph there showing that we're about 22 million people, um, and we're about that right now, um, reaching that in Florida now. This is what's holding them um, back from these more uh, rural lands that the animals still have. So we run Buck Island Ranch, and it is a beef cattle operation, which might seem strange to people that a, that a conservation environmental organization also is running a beef, beef operation. Um, but like I said, in, in Florida, these ranches are also conservation lands. And they are amazing research opportunities and partnership opportunities for us to work with landowners. So I listed out just a few of the types of research that we do there. Um, water quality is a huge one. And not only are we doing water quality projects on, on our land, but we have built trust over many years with other ranchers. So our, our people are also going to other ranches and working on projects with them. In fact, um, oh, I forgot to put his name on there. Uh, uh, Gene, who's down, uh, Gene Lawless, who's down on the bottom right in that photo, he, was, he just finished up his tenure as the president of the Florida Cattlemen Society. So it shows it's a, it's a conservation organization, but we're also um, have credibility with all of these uh, ranchers, with all these landowners as well. Um, took, a long, took a long time to build. Four pillars, uh, sustaining grasslands, ranches, and working lands. I wanted to move past the ranches and talk about the sentinel landscape. We are working with ranchers, but another type of working land our military lands, the Sentinel landscape. These are photos from the Avon Park Air Force range. And uh, many folks also don't realize the benefit that Air Force ranges play. These are huge properties. And if you think about it, if you need to train your military, and especially if you're flying vehicles over and you need to practice maneuvering and shooting and all that stuff, you need space. You need a lot of space. So Archbold has been working for 20 something years with the Avon Park Air Force range. Um, so you can see they have, they have pine forests there, they have prairie, they also have Florida scrub habitat as well. Oops, there we go. Um, moving on to connecting landscapes and wildlife corridors. We, Archbold didn't put this together, but this is this Florida 2070 uh, projected trend. You can see all of the red areas are the ones that could be developed. I don't know about you, but when I look at this picture, that, is, uh, that doesn't look like good news to me. So what do we do about that? Well, um, Archbold is part of this coalition of, of nonprofits and people who are trying to get um, recognition for and protection of the areas that are still wild. And that includes working lands like the Sentinel landscapes and the ranches. Uh, this is a really big deal. Last year, the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act uh, was put in place and it designates, it's the map that you see right, right there, it designates 18 million acres in Florida um, as part of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And um, it's securing money to help protect those lands. It doesn't just turn all of this into a nature preserve, but it recognizes this as an important area and, and it secures money to help with conservation on those lands. And it, it looks to me from what I've read that the conservation easements will be the main, um, the main way that money is going to be used. 
but we're also still in the early days of this. This was just passed, and there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes with various nonprofits, all these different groups trying to work together and prioritize, you know, what should happen with this with this Wildlife Corridor Act. It's really exciting stuff. Um, I do want to want to mention that the photos of the bears and panthers and all of that in the bottom left there are from Carlton Ward Jr. Addressing climate change, our last pillar here. This is um, uh, these 10 places that were recognized in this Endangered Species Coalition um, report that they did, 10 ecosystems to save for endangered species because of climate change. And if you look here, I and they're not in any specific order, but if you notice out of the 10, two of them are in Florida, um, the Gulf Coast area, and then the greater Everglades, which is, I, was, I said the Northern Everglades, the headwaters of the Everglades, the greater Everglades means both the South half and the North half of the Everglades. So for instance, this mentioned the red cockaded woodpecker in there, that's a species that Archbold works with at the Avon Park Air Force Range. So what are we doing to un better understand climate change? Um, we are doing cores of our lake. Uh, we have a, a lake that's almost 70 feet deep and then it has all of these cores of sediment or has all these layers of sediment at the bottom. We're doing cores of that. Uh, Evelyn Geyser there is, uh, is a researcher that studies the lake. What she has in front of her there is a buoy. That's not doing the cores, but we have a buoy out in the center of the lake that's studying temperature and probably some other things too. Um, and, but those lake cores are amazing. We have researchers look up there, they put tubes down at the bottom, they pull up all this mud, and what you have is thousands of years of lake deposition. It's amazing. We have something like, uh, I think, was it 47,000 years of, of layers, something like that. It's over 40,000, which kind of blows your mind. And that, and that tells you what was happening in the past because you have pollen in there. So you know what was happening with the plants. Um, and there's other types of um, like bacteria and things you can look at too. To give, you, to give you an idea of what climate has been like going you know, tens of thousands of years uh, in the past. We also do phenology, which is what that tower picture is in the right there. It's taking a picture, a picture of this field. And phenology is the study of seasons and, and natural cycles. So that is part of a network that's international where these little towers are set up all over the world photographing grasslands. So scientists can watch and see change happening um, from season to season, but also can keep an eye out or any changes that seem to be um, you know, related to climate change. Uh, and then greenhouse gases, we're also measuring greenhouse gases um, at our cattle ranch. Um, you know, Not just from the cat, I put a picture of a cow there, but not just from the cattle, but also natural sources of, uh, of greenhouse gases like wetlands. So moving on to our last, part here, I want to talk a bit about education. And I also will just say, um, before we jump into this, that there are a lot more things that Archbold does too. This is really just a snapshot, really. Um, but education, we have a, a robust program for K-12 education, particularly for elementary school kids. So that's field trips, virtual programs, um, and, and a summer camp. We do uh, judging. I go. I was just a few of us were just at a science fair, uh, judging science fair last week. Um, community events, all kinds of things. But it's not just kids. We also have um, college students coming here. We have professionals, um, all kinds of different lifelong learner groups. Um, the picture in the top left there are two of our interns. So we're also training, uh, we, have, we have a robust internship program that's had, I don't know what we're even up to now, over 500, I think we're close to 600 interns over the years, which is pretty amazing. So we don't just do the research, we're also involved in those conservation projects like the Wildlife Corridor. And we also want to make sure that Archbold's a site for training um, professionals, 
for, for training young professionals and for training children. So we're getting everybody. Um, and non-professionals too, just anybody who's interested and, and wants to know more about um, endangered species and land management and all of the different environmental issues going on in this part of Florida. I, uh, I, I love, this is my, my pet project here. So um, I'm also a photographer and basically every photo that you've seen so far I, I took uh, and I'd love to photograph researchers. So I've, we, one of the things we've done in education is use the pictures with um, our, our teaching for kids. So in summer camp, um, I'll show the, the kids the photo. This was from 2019. And then they drew themselves as scientists. And then they got to dress up as, as Archbold scientists. And I photographed them the same way I photograph, I photograph adults. So it was great. Gosh, so I have a hundred of these, but some of them you can see, like uh, Lexi is a, um, was working here at the time as a biologist, and this is her younger sister who wanted to look, you know, just like her, her big sister for her photo. Then the children receive the, their photo and are asked to write some kind of statement with it. So Landon's holding a bear skull. He says, I'm holding a bear skull because we need to protect habitats so animals don't end up like this bear because it's a, because it's a dead bear. Uh, I'll share ju just one of these with you, but I have, you know, I have a hundred of these. They're they're pretty fantastic. Uh, Atia says, "I believe that animals should be treated how we want to be treated. We want to be treated with kindness and to be treated fairly. We are all living things. We have the power to help those in need. Animals have a right as much as we do." anything they need to do. And here is the most recent version of working with these photos with children. This is still in beta testing, but we now have these this 360 virtual reality world. You can put goggles on and, and move around. You can click on the photos. You can, um, we have 13 different habitat uh, scenes click on pictures, learn all about the scenes and about the research that's going on. And so this is something that we'll be rolling out in the next couple months. We have sent it to some teachers as a beta, uh, but this is, has, a has a whole um, teacher's guide that goes with it for third to fifth grades. There we go. I'm wrapping up now, but I want to say mark your calendars. April 1st through, April 1st through the 3rd is the League of Environmental Educators in Florida. Uh, it's our first big conference that we've had in what, three years. We, we, did, we did a virtual conference last year, which was fantastic, but this is actually an in-person conference. I'm the chair of this. So if you have questions about the conference, when we get to the question part in a minute here, um, please ask me. But this is this is going to be a lot of fun. We have um, someone who's on Friday night will be acting out one of the characters from A Land Remembered. We have uh, a speaker to talk about the wildlife corridor, and we'll have all kinds of talks and auctions and fun stuff. So that's my plug for Leaf. And now I can take questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen because otherwise I can't see. I can't see you, I can't see your faces. So I'll stop sharing. And now um, I would love if we have some questions. This is the fun part for me is getting to, to know what interests you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dustin. I really liked seeing all those kiddos in their grown up science outfits. If anyone has any questions now is the time to put them in the chat. Um, we did have one so far, Dustin. Um, it was in reference to the Avon Park. Is that um, somewhere where they do bombing? Does that interfere at all? Yeah, I know it's, if you've never heard of this as uh, like the idea that bombing ranges are great for animals and rare species, it's kind of going to challenge your perceptions a little bit or blow your mind a little bit. But yeah, the, that that range is an active military air force range. So 
It's 106,000 acres. It's gigantic. Um, and it does not it seem, in fact, it's, it's a positive. I mean, it has these rare species on it. So it doesn't appear that anything that they're doing out there is harming these rare species. Um, and it's even part of their mission, too, for those lands to, to take care of the wildlife. They're, so they have a military mission, but, but part of their mission is also conservation, right? So they have um, their own staff. There's, there's U.S. Fish and Wildlife people who work there. Uh, my wife is one of them. Um, and there's a whole Archbold staff of like six people that, have, that are up there as well. Um, and keep in mind, I didn't talk about fire, but keep in mind, fire is so important for almost all the habitats in Florida. So take the Florida, take the Florida dry prairie where the Florida grasshopper sparrow is. Um, and, that, and that military range is one of the only last few places where this bird lives. Um, that burns naturally every one to three years from, from lightning fire. That's, that's all the time. Grass pops up, lightning hits, does it again. And that's what those, what those birds need because if even one tree, even one tree pops up within something like 200 meters of their nest, which is just on the ground, those babies are gone because a hawk will fly in and grab them. So you need fire. So that works pretty well if you need to drop you know, if you're dropping bombs and, and stuff and, and a fire goes, even accidentally, um, it's not going to be different than what was happening naturally out there. Sound, I have no idea. I mean, nobody's studying what the sound effect could be, but these, these endangered species are out there and they're doing great. Thank you. Yeah. And is your facility open to the general public? Probably, yes. Uh, our gate is still closed for walk-in visitors. But if you have a group, you can book a tour. So we're still open for scheduled tours. Okay, so they can go on your website and find the information and schedule a tour with you guys. Yeah, I mean, it's oh, me. Wonderful. So just email email me. I had my email. Well, I had it up briefly. I can stick it back in here. Yeah, I can stick it in the chat too. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the status of grasshopper sparrows at Avon Park? Numbers and number of breeding pairs. Um, is there progress with breeding in captivity, if you know? Yeah, I, I don't want to share any specific numbers because I don't mm -hmm. know them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be wrong. Um, but at all sites, the grass out, and I, there's, a, there's five sites, I think. I'm not, I could be okay. missing one um, that are known sites. The numbers are, you know, are, are down. At, at sites where they've been monitored for long periods, I mean, it was just watching them crash. Um, and then some, there's been some places that have only been, at least by the biologists, known that they were there for a little while. Um, so at all sites, there's not that many around anymore, but captive breeding is the big, that's the big thing that we're hoping will, will save them. That's been happening for the last five years, maybe, um, where birds, some birds are taken from the wild, raised, and now we have you know, there's a lot of them have been raised. There's a couple different places doing it. And then they're brought back out and put into some of the uh, different properties. And the hope is that this will give, will be an, a kickstart enough to keep, to get their numbers back up. Um, but what's difficult is that we still, there's still questions about what exactly happened in the first place. Was it disease or was it um, some other thing like a uh, fire ant? Or, yeah, fire ants or tree, a tree being within 200 meters. Or is there carnivore issues like are skunks eating more of them than they're used than they used to? So researchers are looking into all of those other those other parts. And what they do now is whenever there's a nest, they put a little fence around the nest that's only like a meter high. Um, and when, if it's going to be a big rain event that could flood the babies, they'll actually raise a few inches. They'll raise up the nest itself. Well, <laughs> Sorry, should have hit mute. Um, and they kill all the fire ants within a certain distance with boiling water, uh, a certain distance of the nest. So they are working so hard. On their, and this is Archbold, but it's other partners too are working really hard on this.
Thank you. And there was a, a kudos on your amazing photos of the kids. Um, next question is, where does your funding for Archbold come from? And are you guys ever at risk of losing it? Oh, interesting question. I've never heard anybody say, are you at risk of losing it? It comes from a variety of sources. We do have an endowment that Richard Archbold, our, our founder, left us. But when I say that, people always think like, oh, okay, well, then they're fine. That is only a, like, a, you know, a little kernel that would keep us running. Um, but we, remember I said we have grown much larger than what we were back in 1941 when he started us. So we have um, contracts, grants, and donations. Uh, and then the ranch pays for itself. Uh, and pays for some of the research at the ranch. So it's just a, it's a whole mix. There's definitely um, like National Science Foundation pays for some things. It, that, that stuff's all competitive. We, we are an independent nonprofit organization. So people will say, oh, aren't you federally funded? We're not. We will compete for federal funds for grants or like with the military, those are contracts that we have to compete for every four years. And another place could swoop in and get us. There's, there's usually competition for this stuff. Um, so we have a lot of big plans and you can see those areas we're working in. Um, and we are limited by the funds that we do have because there's so much work that could be done. So we're always cultivating new donors and we have, uh, we have someone here who that's, you know, her, her whole job is working on donor relationships. Uh, I could say even for the education department, my intern is paid for by a donor. We give coloring books to all of the kids who come for field trips. It's a donor that pays for all those coloring books. But then my paycheck comes from the endowment. Thank you. And next question is, do you guys work with HOAs and your surrounding rural neighborhoods um, to educate them? And do you include suggestions for financial incentives to protect the area around them? I think this is pretty limited for, mm -hmm. for Archbold. I mean, we always want to be good neighbors. And when we get invited out places, I'm going to a retirement community next Monday and giving a talk. You know, they invited me to come and give a talk. Um, so we do that type of thing when we're invited. Um, I don't think that we really, yeah, like making financial incentive stuff. Um, we really focus more on large landowners like the ranchers. So in that 2.6 million acre region of the Northern Everglades, a million of that is private cattle ranches. So that's, that's our big focus. But now with the Corridor Act, with that bill being passed, um, I'm not sure how that will affect things. We also have a map making, a, uh, a data and map making um, program here. So we have all kinds of maps of, of Florida and can help agencies make decisions we can we like we are not generally doing the advocacy ourselves for something we are providing the data the maps the papers that help other people make decisions wonderful and what kind of volunteers does archbold use um, we use volunteers in many of the different programs though i'd say that during the pandemic you know we scaled that almost down to zero. And we've just started to like turn the knob back up and, and get volunteer the program rolling again. Um, but in theory, you could use volunteer for anything if they have the right skill set. We use them a lot in education. Our field trip program is really wouldn't be able to run without the volunteers are running most of that. Um, but even with field work uh, with a lot of manual like pulling weeds, uh, which is a not a very nice way of saying you know, uh, invasive species removal, or that's a lot of a lot of that is volunteer hours helping us combat invasive species. But we also have volunteers that will help go out and um, help with with scrub jay work or with other kinds of things. Though I will say, you're not going to just be able to walk in and say, "Hey, I want to help band a scrub jay." It you know you've got to build trust and relate and a relationship but, and everything with with the biologist before they're going to let you get close to uh, you know get close to a scrub jay okay um i'm not seeing any more questions if anyone has any last ones now's the time to put it in i do have um one question for you dustin 
um, when you are out there, what is one of your most favorite, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be wildlife that you've seen, maybe a plant, but what's one of the coolest things you've seen or one of your favorite memories from being out in the field? Oh, goodness, geez, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what I really like is seeing the scientists in action. So yeah. to me, that is more than, I mean, it's wonderful to go for a walk and just be there when the sun's setting or something like that. Um, you know, in the summer where you have amazing clouds and then you've got like a big old thunderstorm and way in the distance starting to move it, like those moments are super cool. But I really like watching the scientists at work. So I've, and, and I've gotten to see a lot of that. Um, you know, if it's like them handling baby uh, Florida grasshopper sparrows and, and things like that. And I've been to several of the sites that have the grasshopper sparrows because we, work on we work on several of them um yeah that's super cool now we just started last year the end of the last year studying um bears and panthers so i didn't have photos to put up for that but that's a new thing for us we we've done some of it in the past um so hopefully maybe i'll get to go out and see some cool stuff with the with the bear team with the bear they, we call it the predator prey program Wonderful. That sounds great. I did just put um, the website for Archbold in the chat if anyone wants to bookmark that and they've got a lot of great resources on there. Um, we've got some thank yous and one last question I think. Um, can you describe some scrub jay behaviors that would help individuals to be able to observe them in nature? Sure. Um, well, one is they're really, uh, you need to get to some good scrub. They they could be found like if there's a if there's an orange grove or if there's a little bit of this habitat or what is but it's only going to be if there's some scrub next to it. So get in the scrub and there are still plenty of scrub preserves around the state that have them. Um, there used to be almost every county used to have scrub jays in it. I mean they were all over the place back in the day. Um, Oh, the closest to St. Pete is might be Oscar Shear and the ones there, there's there's only like two families or something. There's not many of them over there. I'm not sure the number. Um, in terms of actually looking for them, they don't fly high. They are going to be in um, just hovering just over the vegetation. And then they're always looking for like a, a snag, something to one of them can settle on and be the sentinel to look out and watch, see what's going on. They take turns doing that. They might be on the ground and hopping around on the ground too. But usually for me, I'm, I'm walking out there and um, I just keep my eyes open for something. Just, they look kind of heavy. They don't look like great flyers. They look kind of heavy, just swooping over, landing. And sometimes they start squawking too. So you'll hear them. I mean, it's like shh, shh kind of thing. They don't, have a, they don't really sing, um, but the female, the main lead female does do a call. So if you ever hear that, that's the mama that's doing that. Good to know, thank you, that was wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in with us this afternoon and thank you so much, Dustin, for joining us. It's a pleasure having you. Um, thank you for sharing all the important work that you guys do at Archbold. Florida appreciates it and we appreciate your time and your expertise and we've got yep lots of thank yous coming in on the chat and go check out Archbold's website if anyone wants to learn more about the work they do and thank you everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. All have right. a good one. Thank you. Bye y'all.